All right, Dominica Wilson, everyone. Hello. Good morning. I'm going to keep my timer on so we make sure that we don't go over. I'm going to ask for everyone's patience. Good morning. I want to outline what's to come here. Uh, this will be like a lesson in four parts, I hope. It'll be interactive. A little bit interactive. Don't heckle me. Okay. Um, there will be four lessons and a practicum at the end. If we have the time, I hope to get to questions. Surely we can have a couple questions. Uh, we won't be that tight. Uh, my only question is that you, or my only request is that you don't ask about a certain symbol, but you probably won't. So, uh, can you see the title of the presentation? Okay, this is post political. What is that? Well, this isn't going to be just a primer on the genealogy of this movement, but it is going to be like a how-to guide about how to be post-political. I don't want you to be political. Forget about that. They want you to be political. I want you to be post-political, because that's where your movement comes from. About me. Who am I? How can I tell you these things? Well, my name is Dominica. Uh, I invented the movement. Um, let's see. I gave it its aesthetics. That's right. Uh, uh, its political philosophy. Right. And then, of course, I developed it's all its current law and legal theory. Um, my lesson number one for you, politics. It's fake. It's gay. <laughs> I know, what do I mean by that? So, you know, defense distributed in the 3D gun, they evolve from, or you could say as reactions to, like the, the heights of commanding heights liberalism, uh, the failure of the Ron Paul revolution. This is, you know, the anxiety right before the Obama period, and I think most specifically, 3D guns emerge at that moment where there is a specific anxiety about the perception of the global democratic consensus. Can everyone hear me? You can hear me? I don't need to speak louder. Okay, what's a global democratic consensus? Uh, well, it's described beautifully in Rancière, if you'll allow me, not, not long. The task of modernity, to secularize politics, to demilitarize and diminish it, to remove everything in it which is not functionally ordained for maximizing the chances of success for the collective being, for the simple management of the social. This political task is quite precisely that of politics's self-diminution. In short, in the theory of Rancière, politics is the art of suppressing the political. Now this isn't new, right? I'm not saying, uh, I'm saying it's accurate, right? But I'm saying it's not unique. In fact, in the theory of uh, Rancière, politics has always been the art of suppressing the political. Why do you think Joe Biden won? Uh, well, you can say it was rigged, but then that's just another way of saying the same thing. Uh, I want to discuss then these domains of suppression before we you know, get into the practicum and the, and the lessons. How are we depoliticized? Well, these domains should be recognizable to you, especially after the year that we've had. Uh, they are by expert knowledge, the progressive fantasy of expert administration of the social, Number two there, participatory governance, which is all theater, but everyone has a role to play. You have a civic duty. Uh, why don't you go watch the polls and get kicked out? That's fun. Uh, and then, of course, multiculturalism, a huge spectacle, uh, a grief complex in industry, uh, and obviously a way of diluting your voice, your capacity for exit, uh, your own felt and perceived power. Uh, and then uh, I, I need not really comment on ecology and biopower. It's really all it took, a little, a little coronavirus uh, to get rid of any illusion you had of political freedom. So these domains of depoliticization, we can say that both in the formal structures of government and the informal, they, in their conspiracy, contribute to what we can call a war on noticing. Oh, the war on noticing, it's just like Weimar. Well, what do you mean, Dominica? Okay, just a thought experiment. Say that the Trump insurrectionary force actually did sack the Capitol, right? And that dude with the horns, he, sets up a new government, installs and impanels a grand jury and starts issuing subpoenas and making demands. Do you think you would have found out about that on YouTube? No, but your 3D gun printers, most of you, some of you, and you know that because of course, even in those rare moments where the formal structures of power tell you, yeah, sure, fine, share the stuff, the informal structures uh, let you know that you cannot. Uh, now, I'm not trying to be cynical, okay? But if we're in a war on noticing, and that's the essence of the political, then the post-political would be to notice a problem of perception. What can we notice? 
I'm at five minutes, good. I, I hope we have time for questions. Uh, this is a picture of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. Yeah, okay. Uh, result of a $400 billion uh, DOD program, you know, many years uh, belabored, delayed, etc. What did it produce? A plane which could not fly in the rain. Look it up. Uh, among other things, this thing could only meet its mission targets and its uh, required mission periods, let's say 30% of the time mission capable, right? Abysmal, a supply chain which could not be managed, completely, completely inestimable to the DOD process, too complex, cannot even invent systems to track the part redundancies, uh, the part repair requests, all right? It cannot fly at a 20 degree angle. What else can we notice? In the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense, a industrial capabilities report for fiscal year 2020. Huh, I didn't hear about that in the news. Well, you're not supposed to. Remember, it's a war on noticing. Excerpts from this report, I love it, you know, just because I, I deal with these things a lot. I wanna have a pull quote here. I mean, obviously, the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense admits American defense industrial and manufacturing capability has been lost. Oh, did you not know that? The pull quote, while total manufacturing output might have grown in the last 10 years, the workforce on which a defense industrial renaissance would depend and that renaissance is, of course, outlined as a congressional priority. Uh, that renaissance is, in effect, and the workforce which would create it, uh, an endangered species. Since I have just a moment, I will pull one more quote. Yeah, well, you know, I want to respect the other speakers. You know, so. Okay. I'll. And also, you'll notice Ragnar here, he dead named me. Do you understand what a dead naming is? Shame! Shame! Ragnar, I am electing you for cancellation, the first cancellation of the Congress. And I tried to sponsor you and everything. Yeah. Uh, so China has emerged as a major machine tool customer in the world, right, in the last 10 years, right? But the trends in, in uh, what would be like a, uh, a successful manufacturing economy are, are mostly the machine tool industry, the way that the Undersecretary of Defense has defined this. And he's basically said, or this report has said that, uh, the machine tool industry laid the groundwork for the mobilization miracle, the so-called mobilization miracle uh, of the Second World War, a fact which is understood by our friends and foes alike. But America has allowed its machine tool sector to turn from a national asset into a, a, a national security vulnerability. So here's an irony, right, where the DOD tells us actually it's a liability that not enough people are out there learning the machine tool industry, how to build with defense industrial techniques and learn that science. Ultimate irony, of course, is the future of oriental despotism where it's literally a crime for you to learn these things and to share that knowledge with other people. This is what's coming in America, but somehow, ironically, not what's expressed as a priority by the defense industrial complex. Uh, now look, I'm not just being bitter. What I want you to know is that in the post-political era, you're gonna have to repeat this after me, right? What are we looking at? What do we wanna notice? Class, repeat after me. Neoliberalism with, ch repeat after me, neoliberalism with Chinese characteristics. Very good. All right, that was lesson number one. Lesson number two, no gestures of loyalty, right? So this is a how-to guide. I don't want to bore you with like Baudrillard and heavy theory and stuff. That got me nowhere for years, but you're, you're still here. And so let's just talk about how-to, right? Oh, it's nice to have the dream, freedom technology and everything, but let's have habits of mind, right? Uh, your lesson number one is politics is fake. Right? Don't get involved. Don't think of it. it. It's fake. It's gay. Okay? Listen. Lesson number two. No gestures of loyalty. What do I mean? Now, this is fatherly instruction, I promise you. Everything delivered here, spirit of love. I'm so happy that you all exist now. It was a very lonely, lonely period, and I feel, you know, like that fatherly figure. I may not always be around like your real dad, but I'm here now, <laughs> and I'm here to give advice. So, uh, this is a, a hero of the movement, our friend and yours, uh, uh, Jay Stark. He's in his Garden of Gethsemane moment, uh, in, in what is arguably the classic document of this generation of 3D printed guns, Plastic Defense on YouTube. I'm sure everyone here has seen it. Beautiful document. Jay Stark having some difficulty in the garden, explaining an aspect of his politics. He knows he needs to have a politics and has surely got one because he's doing it, right? He wants to explain it, but he's a little limited. Uh, and I don't hold this against him because, of course, he's, uh, you know, stuck in the fake and gay politics of his, of his country and his time. Uh, but here's his statement. We kind of don't like extremists because they usually start a fierce conversation or debate. Uh, I think this is an accidental and omissive statement. And its ironies are that it, one feels like the suppressive, depoliticizing talk that we just talked about. Well, what's wrong with a fierce conversation or debate, right? Uh, the politics of the day tells you that's what's wrong and that we don't need to have that. I think if we give this, well, of course, the second irony is, is Jay Stark is saying this about extremists while wearing a mask in the woods. 
um, someone needs to tell him. Uh, again, all delivered with love, okay? But what I have to say about this is, let's say if we give it its most generous or gracious interpretation. Jay Stark is expressing something of the difficulty of, let's say, moderation of a community, especially one which has to persist with pseudonymity, anonymity. Look, we're trying to build guns. You know, we don't want to get into the, these, these sidetrack things. And, uh, you know, I, I have a bit of this experience when in my day I was managing the DEFCAD IRC in forums. Uh, my strategy was to not moderate, okay, not just because of the feds, but I didn't want to control the conversation. And every community has this problem of moderation. In my case, we got something worse than extremists. We got FOSCAD. Anybody from FOSCAD here? Okay, good. I don't feel bad about that now. Uh, so it was a lonely time, like I said. Anyway, so Jay Stark is back in the garden, right? And he's continuing to explain his politics. He's saying, you know, in general, we don't like racists, we don't like xenophobes, and I think I understand what this kind of... Uh, this visa is, right? This is a, an offering which is not necessary uh, of, of an olive branch, let's say, to the, the eternal journalist, the, the arch liberal. This is Jay Canrahan. Look at that. Look at how he feels in his face that he can inspect and judge the utterances of Jay Stark. It's quite arrogant. Um, but let me proceed for a moment. See, what Jay Stark is using here is what we would call the new speak of the new faith. It's uncomfortable to see a post-political figure, or a figure who should be, using the word xenophobe. There is no need to say that. And of course, since I'm an adult and have a real view of history, I would point out to you that racists, uh, especially in the case of marginal freedom technologies, resistance movements, and, and in short, terrorism, racists are instrumental uh, and should never, as a rule, just be ruled out of your organization. This is Francois Genot, famous Swiss Nazi, and of course, the original financier of Fatah, Palestinian liberation. Algerian liberation, the Arab Bank of Geneva, uh, his friend Wadi Haddad, God, uh, godfather of modern terrorism, is known to have said to him, Adolf Hitler was a great man. Uh, I hope that that's what Brady quotes me for in this speech. So um, <laughs> when Jay Stark is in the garden, or when you are in the garden next, and you say these things to the journalists, like, well, you know, we don't like racists, and of course we don't like extremists, I'm telling you, that that is nothing other than a gesture of loyalty. And though you are trying to be reasonable, what that journalist, look at him, look at him processing what Jay Stark is saying, all he's hearing is, I am still afraid. Your goal as a post-political figure is not to give these people the hallmarks of a captive mind. And because this is a PDF and not the actual PowerPoint, this screws up my next slide, but your goal is to not get captured. Okay, so I believe this is Time for lesson number three. Let's see how much time we have here. Oh, we're good. We're, we're, we're halfway there. Okay, so uh, lesson number three. You are extremists. Oh, Dominica, I'm not an extremist. I'm a classical liberal. Um, well, I'm sorry. Now, yesterday's classical liberal is, you know, t tomorrow's extremist, Joe Biden's extremist. Again, because this is not a PowerPoint, this is going to mess up my slides. But I know you're extremists uh, for a couple of reasons, right? Uh, the ITAR says you are. You're a felon if you share those files. You're a felon. You know my experience with the ITAR, or you should, and believe me, ignorance of that is no excuse when Joe Biden gets to crack in. Uh, and then, of course, uh, many of you hide your faces. You know you're extremists. You know what you're doing, and, and we'll explain it in a moment. Uh, you also know you're extremists because DHS is here. DHS is in the parking lot taking license plates. Uh, and then finally, you know you're an extremist because I'm an extremist, and I'm public about what I do, so you're more extremist than me. I'm, I'm the least extremist person here, probably. Uh, so this is, a, this is a famous NSA program disclosed, well, confirmed by Snowden in 2013, but disclosed in 2010 by the New York Times. I just like that it's visual and it fits my, uh, you know, the homosexual motif. But uh, what you're seeing is uh, maps of cell phone tower coverage. And this program, which we'll talk about in a moment, maps all the little cell phones which travel together through these areas. And the more areas that these cell phones travel through together, the more the NSA can be sure that we are finding and looking at co-travelers for network analysis. Um, all of your phones made it here today in this room. I promise you, this phone's on that. So your phones are now too, and we're all co-travelers, right? So, you know, welcome to extremism. Uh, now. For bonus points, before I go to the next slide, does anyone know the name of this famous NSA program? Y y what's that? Okay, good guess. The name of this program is FASHA. 
Not subtle. <laughs> so here's a heuristic extremist. It doesn't matter what the apparatus is, all right? It's DHS, right? We're in 2001. We're like, huh, maybe it's not good, George Bush, to create an Orwellian police apparatus to synthesize all of the nation's law enforcement and intelligence. Maybe that'll be used against us one day. No, that'll never happen. And now it's happening. Uh, and of course, what's more salient uh, to our purposes is the example of ITAR, right? ITAR invented as a very uh, legitimate and controlled and constrained way of keeping actual literal munitions out of the hands of the enemy, the Nazis, the, the Japanese, etc. Um, evolves in the Cold War into an architecture uh, for the filtering and the control, the suppression of information itself about this munitions material. That architecture enforces what we call the Iron Triangle, uh, let's say like the bureaucracies, the, uh, the government funding, and the research university, and now it is used by our opportunistic enemy to be a domestic arms control, right? Foucault's boomerang means any apparatus, especially those government ones, eventually swings back, uh, defeats its imperial or colonial purpose, and eventually controls you. Remember, your goal is to not get captured. Uh, okay, many of you know that my experience with the State Department, but in summary, I mean, it's quite absurd, and I don't mean to, to say more about it than is worth saying, but you can sue the State Department about the ITAR or the Foucauldian apparatus. You can tell them, hey, this is illegal, this doesn't, this doesn't work for me, this is bad, and then you can spend millions of dollars in many years, and then maybe the State Department will say, okay, fair enough, uh, we'll move it. Just like in Crypto Wars 1, we'll move it, we'll move it to the Commerce Department. Ah, but then another government comes in, and then another, and then this new government says, ah, we're going to put it back on ITAR. And then you sue again, and then it's frozen. And then, like the current government, it's stuck in this quantum position where it's like, well, I don't know if we want to regulate it on the EAR, that's a decontrol, or should we put it back on the ITAR, probably we'll get both. Probably the Ninth Circuit will say something about, you know, you can't keep this stuff on ITAR, it'll move to EAR, and then Joe Biden, empowered with all of his wisdom and non-dementia, will put it back on the ITAR. And you will say, and you will rightly say, God, that feels black-pilled to me. Now, when this was a PowerPoint, this was a better slide. But anyway, you might take the approach of uh, the guy in the back there with his mugshot, that's Jules Bono, uh, of the Bono gang, these guys were inspired by egoist anarchism, they were hardcore individual anarchists, they were like, look, Dad, we're living for today, we're gonna, can I cuss in this yes. speech? That's what I mean. Always asking the censor what he wants, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, you might take that approach, and I think I'll, most of the people in our movement have because they've seen our example, they know it's absurd, and it feels like, oh, look, I don't have the time, and I want to participate in this, right? Uh, this cartoon here in the middle, uh, this is a, uh, you could say a lot of things about Bono, but they invented the getaway car. So that was cool. Um, and you could say, my approach is legalism. There needs to be uh, civil disobedience. There needs to be noncompliance. And you know what? I agree with you. There's got to be people in this movement that hoist that black flag. We've got to depend upon that. But I am here to say, with our lessons today of the post-political, that this is not necessary. And though J. Stark's attitude is super noble, right? He is determined to be some kind of martyr, if nothing else, in his home state. And I will not dishonor that. It is not the only method, it is not the necessary method. I want to teach you a little more. Um, you might feel like Octave Garnier, this is a member of the Bono gang, this is a prescient suicide note he left before the cops blew his brains out. I didn't want to live this life of present day society because I didn't want to wait and maybe die before I lived. It's beautiful, um, it encapsulates all the vitality and, and angst and, and ambition of youth. I want people in this movement to not feel like Mr. Gagne. I want you to build and to learn and to experience, but I also want to teach you another habit of mind. Um, if you want to be the most black-pilled possible, even before these states get on with their 3D gun laws, which are coming, we see them coming every day, 75 million and more in this country cannot already legally own an AR-15. I've done the math, I've done it for years. This is just with seven states in DC, by the way. This isn't even half the, the, the states in the union. And of course, as you know, with everything that we try to do, half the states in the union show up and they say, you know, not here, and they will likely win. But that is not a reason to pursue illegalism or the martyrdom of, let's say, a Jay Stark. Uh, and lastly, I can dispense with this kind of, um, you know, disturbing iconography of the new faith and proceed to lesson number four. Ah, oh, our comfortable aesthetic. Mm. Lesson number four, I would like you to reconsider the political metaphor of the igloo. Now, you probably think, wow, Cody's here. And the DHS agent, will you raise your hand, DHS agents, anyone? <laughs> well, you probably think, well, he's talking about the Boog. Uh, no, not really. I want you to maybe rescue this image from the Boog, because who knows how much kind of, you know, how that was programmed as a meme, as like disinformation. Consider 
the writings. Okay, I'm going to say igloo for like a lot of times in this bit. Okay, and I'll, what else have I said? I've said Fatah. I didn't say 9/11. I'm just trying to like hit the bingo card now. Um, <laughs> Bin Laden, Arabs. Okay, so anyway, uh, igloos. So consider the words of Sir William Perry, a great Anglo explorer of the Northwest Passage, um, in his first exploration uh, of the North Pole, seeing the Esquimax build. An igloo, he says, it is strange to think that all these measures are taken against the cold. Uh, misspelling, I'm sorry. And all in houses of ice. In the work of Ernst Younger, we hear this written in a different way. He says, you know, an individual can defy superior forces. It is often uh, that he can defy these forces, or she, the state, society, the very elements themselves, uh, by making use of their rules without submitting to them. Okay? I'm going to say it again. The individual can defy superior forces, state, society, the elements, by making use of those elements, those rules, and without submitting to them. I would submit to you that this is why I have offered DEFCAD as a platform for this movement. This is our igloo. Now, uh, there will be an interactive component, like I said, to this presentation. We can build an igloo together in a moment, but this igloo I would like you to reconsider for just a moment. Why do I sponsor this conference? Why have I built DEFCAD to annoy you? to remind you that we're still around? No, not at all. I've built it as a neutral, third-party platform. One of the rules, one of the elements of this society and the legal structure that we have discovered and encountered is, of course, that uh, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230, says that no provider of the user of an interactive computer service will be treated as the publisher or speaker of that information provided by another information content provider. So. In my despair of not being able to you know, legally share 3D files for, let's say, 10 years or something, God, is it 10 years? Yeah, so um, I'm at least able to be a neutral content provider, a platform as recognized by the Communications Decency Act. And so when you choose to share that material, I am not treated, DEFCAD is not treated as the speaker of that material. That is very important because this is a federal law, uh, and these federal laws protect people even like J. Stark and the spicy content that people like J. Stark contribute. What you see here on DEFCAD in all of its aspects is not technical data controlled by the ITAR, is not any other kind of speech that a state or other authority can, can get to. It is speech about the speech, first and foremost. Right here's some reputational stuff with the stars. Right here's J. Stark showing you his, his video. He looks damn good in that, in that thumbnail there that's I mean it's amazing uh, and then we tell you you know here's the mirror here's all this other information about it right now I know that this might be obvious to you but this is a very important protection for when the oriental despots get inspired I know I'll do something Mr. Graywall says no actually and though I have a New Jersey control at DEFCAD that's all perfunctory that's all presentation because state AGs can do nothing in the face of CDA 230. If New Jersey, New York, California, the seven states who ban the AR-15 decide, nope, you can't have 3D data in our states, which they're deciding, it doesn't matter how illegal the content is when it's on DEFCAD because DEFCAD is protected by CDA 230. That's not to mention the First Amendment and all these other very good arguments that we have for maintaining such a platform. We have CDA 230. We have the first few building blocks of our igloo. Now, Again, when this was a presentation on PowerPoint, this would have been funnier, but uh, I trained a, mach a machine tool uh, to learn who was and wasn't like a writer at the trace, and it told me it was this guy. This guy writes for the trace. Uh, you guys might have heard of the trace. Yeah, have you I, no one's going to know what Perfect Hair Forever is, but it was like a famous Adult Swim thing. This is the guy from Perfect Hair Forever. You can see him uh, defending himself against his symbolic castration. Um, <laughs> That's one of the hyperparameters we trained the machine tool on, and it said, yeah, he, he writes for the trace. And so when a journalist from the trace wants to write about DEFCAD, well, wait a minute, why hasn't that happened? Well, it hasn't happened because we use another aspect of the igloo. We use the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And in the terms of DEFCAD, check it out, we say that if you're a writer for the trace, you can't use our computer service. I'm sorry, you can't, you can't even be here, all right? And if you are here, you run afoul of the CFAA, and I swear to God we're bring criminal and civil penalties. You know we will. And so the trace hasn't said a fucking thing about this platform. Oh, how it feels to be on the other side of the barbarous monarchy of the tech platforms. Welcome, please, take advantage of this shield that I have offered you. Now, one more benefit of being on a third party platform like ours, which you know is aligned to protect your interests in development. Let's call this control pew's shoulder thing that goes up. <laughs> now. 
another company recently recognized, hey, this shoulder thing that goes up looks a lot like something that we make. And they said to us, you know, we're the stakeholder. We have the IP here. We have a patent. Take it down. Uh, and then we approach this uh, provider and we go, huh, that's a very interesting argument you have. Uh, we're DEFCAD. We're a neutral content provider. We're not the, you know, creator of this material. But you know what? Just for you, we'll talk to the, the creator of this material and see if he agrees with what you say about your IP. Uh, and so we go to Control Pew. I, I don't think I'm saying anything off the record here or anything you know, unusual. We go, hey, Control Pew, is this the IP of that other group? And Control Pew says, no, of course not. And we go, okay, thanks. And we go back to the group and we go, no, it doesn't check out. This isn't the IP of your group. Uh, I, I, they had nothing else to say. So you can take advantage of that. Uh, so I want to say a couple of the things about DEFCAD because there's always these misunderstandings and I, I want people to, uh, to know that it's actually easy to contribute to this site anonymously. We're not asking contributors in the same way uh, as we are downloaders to give us personal information. Uh, it's never been more convenient to, to contribute anonymously or pseudonymously. Uh, we facilitate that. You don't have to give us your personal information to contribute, to be defended, to take advantage of our igloo. Uh, and in 2021, I know Garrett would want me to say, we have a number of new improvements to our uploader, <laughs> our versioning, and our pre-release process. You know, we want to facilitate those actions which have evolved in this community, uh, which I think are wondrous and amazing. Uh, we want to represent them and make them legible uh, to those who might think about participating in this community. I hope I'm not boring you. Let me check my time. Okay, I'm very close. Good. All right, so practicum. I promised there'd be a practice, uh, an interactive component um, to this speech. And damn it, because it's a... Uh, not a PowerPoint. It, it'll show the answer at the beginning. So you know what? We'll just move through that and try to get to questions. Uh, what I want to give you is a nice little building block, OK? And uh, before I reveal it, I'll just maybe describe it to you. Um, the ITAR has a definition of public domain. And this has always been one of the igloo blocks I like to build with the most, right? Because even though we know the gun controllers want to use the ITAR as this domestic control, it's been such a slippery thing for them to do because the uh, internet was never defined in the ITAR. And when it was, there were all these exemptions and exceptions, which are both legally distinct things, and no one knows what that means, and everyone's just playing with it, both in the federal courts and the state legislatures. Nobody knows what's happening. But one of the great exemptions in ITAR is the public domain exemption, where there's a, n a number of definitions of what is material which is not controlled by the ITAR. Material in a library, for example. You know, we built a library. Uh, material, uh, like, uh, the, I guess the most important thing I want to explain is a building block that you can use, and that I should ask you to use in this lesson, uh, is number six there. Can everyone read number six? Is it too, um, no, it's going to be very difficult for you to read. I'll just read it out to you. Okay. Number six, the definition of public domain number six in CF, uh, 22 CFR 120.11, information distributed unlimitedly at a conference. That information, which is distributed in an unlimited fashion at a conference, generally accessible to the public, is information considered in the public domain by the ITAR. Huh, it's almost as if if we shared material, and technical data for 3D printed guns at this conference, it would not be controlled by federal law and would then be deemed in the public domain. Wow, what a thought. What a thought. Something you should consider doing. Uh, I guess I'll finish on this note. One day humanity will play with the law just as children play with disused objects. I invite you to do that. You don't have to join the Bono gang and invite yourself to a collective suicide. Yeah, it's fun, but also <laughs> you can play with the law. And I think that's the most post-political message I could have for you, that it's a disused object anyway. It's not something that deserves your loyalty, gestures of loyalty. Uh, it's a game for them too, okay? Let's start playing. Thank you.